Praise the Lord. I thought it was wonderful, all that she played. We could hear it in the music room, and uh, I was looking at the words, the songs she was just playing. You see, when the Holy Spirit directs and selects, uh, then uh, he, he grants the heart's cry. And uh, the song is so wonderful. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, Fanny Crosby wrote. Hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling. And that's, do not pass me by. Because we often feel like when Jesus was working with uh, those around us, and we almost feel he's going to pass us by. So the humble heart is crying, do not pass me by. Let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. See, if we were, if we were perfect in our belief, we would be entirely sanctified. If we were perfect in our belief, we would be at all moments trusting Jesus about everything. But when self-assertiveness comes in, then it tells us that at that point we're not trusting. I, I need to trust Jesus tonight. I'm doing that. I'm doing it at the moment. I'm doing it with all I have within me. It's all I have within me. See, I'm, I'm at a loss to know what to do, where to go, how to say, what to call for. So I'm, I'm saying to Jesus, Jesus, don't pass me by. So when I saw him last summer on August the 31st, and he was by my sight, and I saw him as I'm seeing Richard here right now. And I said, oh, Jesus, have you come to talk to me? When I saw him, and what he was telling me that he would show me the way through. And that, that Saturday will be one year. And I have, to, I have to remember that promise and claim that promise. It'll be one year since I... It took me 40 years to see him. I never saw an angel. All I've ever seen that I thought was supernatural to believe was Jesus or angels was a light in my room. And I saw that light right over here in the Parsons. I've seen the light in the Winfield home. I've seen the light when I was a boy. And, of course, I've always responded the same way. I come up right out of bed and say, Jesus, is that you? Are you coming to see me tonight? Ever since I was little. That's what I've said. Because I'd see the light. And see, I knew he was there. I don't know yet whether it was him or whether it was an angel. I don't know. But I know the presence of God was there. So the light, sometimes the light would be very close. Mm -hmm. I'd be against my pillow and wake up, but the light would be right there. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'd come out of my bed, mm -hmm. come right straight up. Oh, Jesus, is that you? And I remember over here at the parsonage, the, the light would go away from me and fade clear out. And I'd sit there and I'd think, oh, Lord, why? You were here somehow. You were here some way. Why didn't you stay? Why did the light go away? I didn't learn about a light and coming in light like that until I read the story of Sammy Morris. Heard Brother Helm tell it. Sammy came out of the deepest of Africa and got in the missionary cottage or in the, in the dorm where they stayed. And uh, he shouted so hard at night because the light would come like a ball of fire and come right up to him. The same light that led him out of Africa through the streams, the, the, the edge of which stopped the crocodiles, from biting him physically. They come to the edge of the light because they know their creator. You see, they don't come any closer than he permits them to. The crocodiles are friendly to Jesus. Crocodiles never bite Jesus. Oh, they don't bite Jesus. And then when you're under the, uh, the everlasting arms, you don't get bit by crocodiles. It's only could you be bit if it were God's will. I never heard of God's will in a biting crocodile, though I suppose there might be an exception somewhere. But that's encouraging mm -hmm. because uh, crocodiles frighten people. They, they frighten me. And I, ooh, I think I remember having a dream once of getting in the jaws of a crocodile. Mm -hmm. And that's a horrible oh, thought. You wake up and just, yeah, they really are. Mm -hmm. it, when they bring that jaw down, there's nothing but God can open it up hardly, and, or dynamite very powerful, something, but it's already the damage is done. Once they lock that jaw in on you, see, yeah. take their prey under. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a thought, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you see, he needed help. <laughs> he needed help to get through there. Mm -hmm. and, and the Lord took him right through the light. He got only to the edge of the light. Wouldn't come anymore. And he got in the mission station. And um, he heard the missionary teacher. I think she was a woman. Uh, telling about Jesus uh, meeting Paul on the Damascus Road in the light. And he, he jumped up and hollered and hollered. And he said, that's the light that led me out of, that's the light I'm following. That's the light that saved me. And uh, tell me more about the Holy Spirit. Well, they couldn't, they told him all they could, and, but he wanted to know more. When he'd get into the, the place of sleeping while the light would come, Jesus would come as a great light. And it was so sweet, and it was so wonderful, he, he would shout, and he would shout, and would he shout. That must have been quite an experience. And of course, he didn't know that he thought the ocean was just a big river that he couldn't see the other side. And he was, she, she asked him, said, well, I don't know anybody that can tell you about the Holy Spirit except Stephen Merritt. And he's in New York City. And, and Samuel said, which way is New York City? And he was over in Africa. And she said, well, it, it's that way, several thousand miles. So he jumps into the ocean and he starts swimming. Imagine. He couldn't see the other side, but he, God had led him out of the darkest of Africa and he was going to try to swim. Of course he couldn't. He was washed ashore. And uh, a pirate ship took him to New York. Very mean people. But I think if you've read the story or heard the story, I believe that he was instrumental in the conversion of a number of those pirates. That's right. And God got a hold of them. Because yes. he was in a church in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he went up to the preacher to ask if he could pray. And it was sort of an intrusion, but the minister let him pray. And, of course, you know the story. I told it years ago. All he did was lift his face and say, My father. And when he did, the power hit the building. And the next thing you knew, the preacher was on the floor and all the people were on the floor and they're all crying for God to get, get right with God. Because you see, he was so pure and he was so trusting in Jesus. He, he just said, my father. And they were just, now that is a slaying in the spirit that I believe in. I don't want anybody putting their hands on me, me going down with, with, uh, without God being in it. Well, there's people doing that. Anybody can place their hands on you and make you fall to the floor. You want to stay away from that person. Uh, I talked to a couple who are now divorced and their trouble started with a quote, slaying in the spirit, unquote. Somebody put them right straight to the floor. And it was a person, if I were to say the name, you would know it. But their troubles in their marriage uh, intensified and surfaced uh, as a result of that experience. Uh, they've been a part of our congregation years ago. Today they're divorced, and not married. Isn't that something? So I'm, I'm saying be very careful about someone who has that kind of power. One of the things that convinces me that Brother Helm walks with God is he can't control the power. If God leaves him as limp as a rag, that's the way he is. If God le it, said, it was said of Jesus, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. So how can I not believe in a person put their hands on me and put me to the floor? There's something wrong with that scripturally. And so I want to be careful about who lays hands on me. And why people get around me and pray and say things I want to plead the blood and say, Oh, God, protect me and help me. Because not all spirits are of God. Unless that life is utterly holy and living for Christ and doing all that they know to walk in the light, then that's dangerous to have any power like that at all. And yet it's all over the world. Robert Allen was in a church of, of Satan and uh, he saw miracles that were greater or as great as anything he's seen in the Christian church. But it, the miracles weren't of God. Satan has the power to do miracles, but he doesn't have the power to save and he cannot really counterfeit love. That's right. He said there was no love in the place. So Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one to another. Sammy Morris was a man of love. And when the power came to him and everybody hit the floor, they couldn't help it because they were slain in the spirit. God put them right down. Yes. And this, this wonderful black man lived in our midst. And as a result of his life, we have Taylor University today. The real supernatural things, uh, I believe it was... Um, uh, Stanley Baldwin, wasn't it, that wrote the book. The real things that were uh, supernatural that really told you the story of God leading him out of Africa, they w the publisher wouldn't let him put it in the book. They didn't want that because it's so unbelievable. 
so that, that didn't get in the book. And uh, it was uh, one day that the Lord sent Brother Helm down to the university and sent him right to the place. In fact, he got on campus and he was informed that the author of Sammy Morse's life was on campus then. And he got to go and sit at his feet and hear the whole story of what Sammy Morse had told him. See, like he sent him to George Washington Carver. He sent him right down. Now, these stories inspired me. I was halfway through Sammy Morse one night. And of course, oh, I love things supernatural. Oh, I love when Jesus works. Yes. I think it's great that he backed the Red Sea up. Mm-hmm. And it's so great. It's one of the yes. greatest things out of the resurrection. It's one of the greatest things in all the Bible. And the Jewish people refer to it over and over and over. And so do we. It's one of the great experiences of God to wash it clear back and roll her back and let them go through on dry land. Oh, they talked about it and talked about it. Scared the Jerichoites all to pieces. Oh, and Rahab I believe. She got word about it before they ever got there. Brother, she hung out the red flag. Tell them she was a believer when they came and her life was spared and she became a great grandmother in the life of Jesus. That's great, isn't it? It's a tremendous thing. So um, so Jesus had me reading that one night and uh, I got happy. I was, oh, I was a lonely person. Yeah, I was so I'm lonely sometimes still. Only Jesus can and when we walk with God, there's a loneliness for everybody. Uh, P- Peter, uh, Brother Wormbrand said, everybody who walks with God goes to prison. They don't have any choice. Prison is an experience for everyone that, that endeavors to walk with God. And oh, I needed help of God. You were a long way off. Scott Depot was somewhere in the unknown. I didn't know you were there. And when I came, I thought that, that it was my death. I thought I never dreamed that there'd be a congregation like this. Never dreamed that there'd be a people like this. I thought that it's simply that the church world would crush me to death. And so when I came to Scott Depot, I came, I came to die. The only reason I came was to obey. The only reason I came was I believed the report. But I didn't come to get blessed. I didn't come. I just came to die. And it took, uh, Otis told me in about four months, he said, now Brother Hoke said, uh, he saw this in me, saw this shake. He said, if you'll just obey God, we'll get between you and the devil. That's what he said. He was the first one to try to speak words of encouragement to me, to try to obey the Lord. And, of course, I tried. But I was reading Sammy Morris one night. And, see, I lived in a home um, where uh, they had an argument in the church. And I didn't find this out till I left. But um, uh, the, the demons got into the walls of the house. And I would awaken at night. And there, if I'd take my belt off and strap this pulpit right here... If I'd take it off and strap this pulpit, you, you would be you would hear a noise. If I'd hit it like this, Barbara can remember, and it would hit the side of the house. Well, I thought someone's out there hitting our house. And I'd jump up and grab my 410, and out I'd go and run the house because I thought someone was beating my house for meanness. There wasn't anybody there. Then I'd wake up at night, and there'd be somebody walking across the roof, just walking. Well, it's so plain. I, didn't want, I thought they were in my attic. So I get my gun and get my flashlight. And don't ask me why I got my gun, but I want to be sure, you know, Jesus could chase them all off, but they were walking very close. So I figured that it was wisdom for me to have a gun. Anyway, I got my gun and went right through the... Listen, it was courage enough for me to even get up in the attic thinking somebody was up there. Gun or no gun. Stick my head up, somebody walking across my... Hearing footsteps, walking right across there. And I'd get up in the attic and shine a light around and there wouldn't be anybody there. So Brother Elm called one out and said, Brother Elm, I don't know what in the world's in this house. What in this world's going on? I told him about the beatings on the walls and the thing. One night we rushed into Brian's room. He was backed up against the wall. He was screaming and he was looking right straight up. I couldn't see what he saw, but he was seeing something. One night he cried so hard, he cried and he cried. I thought his stomach, his stomach must be aching so bad. I called the doctor and got him out of party and we jumped in the car and we took off. Just as soon as we got out of the driveway, he was fine, went to sleep. And I'd already called the doctor out of the party. I was so convinced that something was being torn up on his insides. We got, and I so, I went, drove back in the garage, started back to the house. We got back in the house and he went to screaming again. So we had, we had some experiences we were there out of obedience, you see, trying to obey God. Yes. But it was after I left 
that Brother Helm said something to me one day, and I said, Sir, I said, Lord, I reveal anything to you about that? He said, Well, let me ask you a question. When the home was built, did the church have a fuss? I said, Yes, sir, they did. One man argued and hollered and kept them from bricking the parsonage. The whole church wanted to brick the parsonage, and this one man refused to let them brick the parsonage, and they had a big argument over bricking the parsonage, and they never got it bricked. He said, that's when the demons got into the walls. That man, who's not alive now, painted the parsonage every year. Refused to let the parsonage, and we had to suffer over that. So I'd run out and try to find what was banging the walls. You've not heard me share this probably, uh, I don't think at all. I don't know if I shared it maybe one time, but this is what happened. Oh, we needed Jesus, didn't we? Now imagine, sometimes I would hear the footsteps over the ceiling and I would put my head on the pillow at night and say, now Jesus, I'm so worn out, i got to sleep. And I know there's nobody up there. But I hear somebody walking. Lord, you're going to have to take care of it. I just plead the blood, I lift the shield of faith, I'm going to sleep. And I went to sleep with footsteps. Now, you've got to have God's help, but you hit a point of exhaustion. That's what I did. One night, I was reading the story of Samuel Morris. You see, I need to know that God could intervene supernaturally. I needed to know that God could whip the devil. I needed to know that God loved us and was going to take care of us. So I was reading Sammy Morse's story one night, and I read about where, where the Holy Spirit led him out of the darkest of Africa and appeared when that man was about to bash his skull in and said, Prince Kabu, rise and flee. And how God led him through the forest and through the rivers and into the only piece of free territory around there at that time. And then he got on a boat and went to New York and got with Stephen Merritt. How he got out in the carriage and Stephen Merritt said, look at the big buildings in New York and... Sammy looked at him, but when they finished their courage trip, he said, I came not to see big buildings. I came to be taught of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't interested in civilization and big buildings. What he wanted to know was about the light that led him out of the darkest of Africa and saved his life. I tell you, the glory of God hit me so wonderfully. I jumped up out of there, and if there's any devils around, they sure scattered because I'm telling you, I took a run around the house, and I circled the thing hollering and shouting three times. That never, neighbor, neighbor, uh, neighbors never complained. I was so happy. I said, oh, the fire is so great. And I ran and I hollered and I, I ran and I hollered and I leaped. I said, oh, glory to God for Sammy Morris yes. and for how wonderful Jesus is. That's great, isn't it? Yes, yes. Oh, I'm so glad for a love that will not let us go. Amen. And that's our first hymn tonight. <laughs>